Welcome back, everyone, to JT Show, Super Talk Mississippi. Joining us now in the studio, we're very honored and pleased to have Mr. Ken Starr. He is presently of counsel with the Lanier Law Firm, former judge, former U.S. Solicitor General. Uh, Mr. Starr, it's such an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. It's so good to be with you. It's good to be back on Super Talk after a couple of years. Well, it, again, it is a truly an honor, sir. Your your career is quite distinguished, and you are quite an accomplished uh, American. And uh, this country, I would say, is proud of you in that regard. I know you've Thank been. Thank you. Yes, sir. You've been focused uh, somewhat on uh, what you're terming as a crisis, and that's uh, religious liberty in this country. And you and I were just talking off the air. It's it's like the pandemic has kind of brought this into even more uh, perspective. It really did, and it was what prompted me to write the book. That is, with the pandemic in March of last year, uh, a number of governors uh, issued orders that really stopped worship services or severely limited worship services, and this was truly a first in American history. And they did so in ways, some of the governors, obviously not all or even a majority, but in some of the largest uh, states in ways that really severely uh, hampered the ability of people of faith to gather together to assemble, even though they were willing to abide by all of the protocols in place, masking requirements, social distancing, and others. And the extreme case what came out of Nevada when the governor there permitted essentially casinos to operate at half capacity, which could be literally many hundreds of <laughs> people, but places of worship, no matter how large the sanctuary or auditorium, the place of worship, were limited to 50, 5 and you just said, you know, this isn't right. So this was the occasion when I said, we need a book that talks about our history and tradition of religious liberty in our country, which goes back to the founding, it's firmly rooted in our Constitution, and that will be available to everyone, accessible to everyone. I like to, as a grandparent, I like to envision grandparents reading to their grandchildren, or obviously parents to their children. But I wrote in such a way that high school students, and maybe even some middle school students, can read and understand they don't have to worry about, oh, I don't think I went to law school. Not to worry. This is for Americans. This is for Americans who love our culture of freedom and want to learn more about it. When you hear the example, uh, Mr. Starr, about uh, Nevada in, in that case, the inconsistent application there. Well, the casino, these are the rules. And the church, these are the rules. Do you feel that that is intentional? Is it is it an intentional targeting and uh, inequitable treatment of a religious institution? Is, is there some intent there? It's um, you know, judge not that you be not judge, but it's hard <laughs> to understand. Um, so it's a f- natural inference to draw that there must be something that is saying essentially, and many uh, governors did, worship and the gathering together of people of faith, whatever their faith is, is simply not essential. Think of that. That is not essential. So, yes, going to the hardware stores, obviously the grocery store and so forth, these are essential activities. But so is the gathering together of people who want to gather together. Again, abiding by the protocols, that's one of the key things. They weren't saying we do not intend to wear masks or whatever the order might be. And that was what struck me as being so extraordinary. So... Let's just take what they did, the governors did, and then let's compare that then to the great and fundamental principles of American liberty. That's what I'm trying to do in the book. Yeah. It's hard to believe that uh, here so many years after our founding, which to a great extent was based on religious liberty, that we're having to have this fight, it seems like, in the public square. Yes, it looks as if we've not progressed uh, in time. Uh, To the founding generation, religious liberty was really at the forefront. Even before in the First Amendment you get to freedom of speech and freedom of the press, you come to religious freedom, including something which is really under pressure these days, and that is 
the ability of individuals to follow the dictates of their conscience, you know, within reason, but to be able to say, no, I cannot, in fact, accede to that practice or that law, that regulation. And historically, we've protected that, but we're moving away from it. Here's the good news. The Supreme Court of the United States has rallied, including very recently, in favor of these religious liberties, including freedom of conscience, and they're doing so they being the justices, unanimously. Hmm. That's a source of great comfort. Hmm. And I talk about it in the book, that even though the culture may be shifting ground, the Supreme Court remains a great friend of religious liberty. It has nothing to do with their personal views. It has everything to do with our Constitution and the Bill of Rights. That's good to know, because they're obviously liberal justices presently on the court. And and most of uh, what what appears to be these these kind of targeted inequities at at religious institutions are coming from left states, uh, Democrat governors and and Democrat leaders, et cetera. So that's that's actually comforting to know that when it comes to the Supreme Court, even those that would be considered on the left side of the aisle uh, find that that uh, this is a problem. <laughs> And they are upholding our constitutional framework. Exactly. In, in a highly polarized environment, yeah. we they are finding common ground where they can unanimously, in controversial situations, not easy situations, say, we are striking a blow in favor of religious liberty. Yeah. That's what the book hopes to convey. Where it gets, I guess, complicated is uh, when you start to integrate that into the private um, business settings, private sector. When you've got uh, certain business owners or business managers that uh, make certain decisions and take certain action in their operation of their business based on their religious beliefs, and that's considered uh, trampling on others' rights. How do we deal with that? How do we reconcile well, th- that? And that's a very important uh, issue, and happily, once again, the Supreme Court has spoken to it in the case a few years ago called Hobby Lobby. We yeah. all know what Hobby Lobby is. And there, the court upheld the right of this conscientious family, the Green family of Oklahoma City, to follow the dictates of their conscience with respect to providing certain kinds or refusing to provide certain kinds of contraceptives. They said these three we will provide as required by the government. We will will follow and the government's dictate with respect to 18 of these methods, but three of them we view as taking of uh, innocent life. That's our view. Not everybody's going to agree with it, but welcome to America where people have different views. So are (laughs) we going to accommodate that view and the Supreme Court upheld the right of that family in a for-profit family-owned enterprise to, in fact, live out their religious liberty. Now, of course, many uh, companies are publicly held, yeah. and that makes it much more complicated, yep. a governing board, a CEO, and so forth. Yep. But at least for family-held enterprises, the Supreme Court, once again, has struck the blow in favor of religious freedom. It, it also, uh, I guess, makes me think about the Little Sisters of the poor, I believe, right? I mean, a not-for-profit entity that had the same issue. Yes, exactly. Trying their best to live out their faith and following the dictates of their order's uh, conscience. And there again, the Supreme Court has been very solicitous, very supportive of the religious liberty of these groups, including, and if we have time to talk about it, maybe in the next segment, a case involving the city of Philadelphia and Catholic social services. Huge win for religious liberty, and once again, unanimously. Wow. So uh, we got just a couple minutes in this segment. How can we protect our faith, just the average citizen out here? What can we do to keep our religious liberties intact? One of the basic things is education. Education is so formational. Indeed, let me quote, uh, it's very short, from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, reenacted by the First Congress in 1789, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and Mm. the happiness of mankind. Mm. Schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. So we know education is empowering, it's transformational. I think, and this is what the book is designed to do, so we can educate ourselves, doesn't matter how old you are, about our culture of freedom. We educate ourselves, we inform ourselves so we can be intelligent citizens in the marketplace of ideas. Hmm. It it just seems like that when government gets busy and they start making laws and they start making rules and regulations and policies, 
it always kind of has these unintended consequences, as they are referred to, where, well, we didn't really think about that, so to right. speak. We're going to talk yeah. about that in the next segment. If, if you'll respond, we'd appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. We got Mr. Ken Starr in the studio. Stay with us, the JT Show. We'll be- Welcome back, everyone, the JT Show, Super Talk Mississippi. Ken Starr is our guest in the studio talking about religious liberty and uh, his book, Religious Liberty in Crisis, Exercising Your Faith in an Age of Uncertainty. So, Mr. Starr, we were just talking about how often government, sometimes with good intentions, uh, and it's not just religious liberty, but uh, anytime you have something that is so foundational like this, it, it uh, is a, a high-priority sort of item and, and a high-profile item that we need to be concerned about which is they make laws and they make regulations and they make rules and so forth that they think are helping one group, but at the same time they're encroaching on another, or certainly from a rights perspective. That seems fairly uh, appropriate for this subject matter. It certainly is. Uh, In fact, your suggestion uh, of unintended consequences uh, puts me in mind, and I discuss this in the book, of school boards Uh, And we've litigated this issue. Once again, the Supreme Court of the United States has rallied to the side of religious freedom. But here's a specific human example. A high school sophomore named Bridget Mergens wanted to start a Bible study club in her large public high school. And the school board said no, all the school authorities, and said no, if we allow you to do that, we would be violating the Establishment Clause that you should not Hmm. be promoting religious activity, et cetera, as a school. Uh, And this case went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, and the Supreme Court upheld her right to have her Bible study club. The school board had forgotten religious freedom is the baseline. Now, you cannot have school teachers and the public schools uh, system trying to proselytize. We all understand that. There, there are limits. But when we're talking about a truly voluntary act of religious liberty, then let's protect that. And the school board just completely, and the school officials along the way, completely forgot that. And <laughs> what I hope that my book will do is help educate, overcome some of these, whether they are prejudices or whether it's ignorance, Whatever the source is of the refusal to permit freedom to flourish, we have a sweet land of liberty. And if you're not allowing freedom to flourish, if you're saying, no, we're going to cancel you out, then there's a real serious issue. And I hope that this book will provide an avenue for people to educate themselves and be able to converse in the marketplace, going to the school board and saying, wait a second, I'm not a lawyer, but here's what uh, I understand to be one of the principles of religious freedom that binds us all together. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems to me like just common sense. It, it's not compulsory. You're not requiring students to join these groups, and you're not conducting uh, and endorsing these groups necessarily. You're just giving them the freedom to organize, associate, assemble, and use their own resources, and maybe meet in a classroom every now and then or something. I'm glad you use terms like assemble and associate <laughs> because uh, I don't know where you went to law school, but you learned very, very quickly. Not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a citizen, and you're yes. an informed citizen, and that's what this book is designed to do. Uh, in fact, let me mention a case that the Supreme Court just decided three months ago unanimously, and they talked about the free exercise of religion of Catholic Social Services of Philadelphia, which was unwilling to place foster children in the homes of non-traditional families. So it was really part of the culture. Wars, and Philadelphia said, you're going to lose, and we hereby de-license you, so you're out of business, even though Catholic Social Services had been providing these kinds of services to the children, the precious, needy children of Philadelphia, for well over a century. The Supreme Court of the United States unanimously upheld the right of Catholic Social Services to follow the dictates of its conscience as a free exercise of religion. And then one of the things that the court made very clear is Catholic Social Services is not trying to impose its religious views on anyone. Right. That was your point right. about these precious children in schools trying to form their Bible study clubs and so forth. And again, if everyone 
stops yelling at one another and just says, you know, freedom really is the baseline. So how can we be most promotive of freedom because that promotes human dignity, that promotes community? Right. So we also, I guess, uh, have to think about what's going on in Afghanistan. I mean, to a great extent, what's happening there is rooted in religion. Exactly uh, and, right. And there, I've seen reports from, from American Christians, uh, even Jews in the country, that uh, and other faiths, it doesn't really matter. If they're not strictly adhering to the wishes of the Taliban from a religious perspective, their very lives are at stake. It's a terrible tragedy. And one of the cruel ironies is that after World War II and what happened in Europe, especially under uh, under Hitler's terrible regime, is that the world came together, led by, among others, Eleanor Roosevelt, and they fashioned the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And one of those provisions, Article 18, lifts up the idea of religious liberty for all persons. It's a fundamental part of humanity and human dignity. And that's what's at stake in the unfolding tragedy and disaster of Afghanistan, targeting minority faiths and persecuting them and indeed even martyring these terribly uh, endangered individuals from different communities of faith. I know you talk about uh, a chapter, at least in the book, talking about cancel culture. And, and one of the things that I think uh, has, has really come into focus, given this Afghanistan debacle, we've talked about it here on, on the program this week, is that to a great extent we're spoiled when you look at Afghanistan. Yet we have, and, and what I mean by that is, while we certainly have to be vigilant, as you explain in the book, in protecting our freedoms, and we've, we've got to hold our leaders accountable to make sure we do that. The fact is, what we deem to be uh, problematic, certainly by many on the left who are constantly criticizing this country, uh, demeaning it, degrading it, and referring to it as unfair and, and systemically this, that, and the other, and and persecutory in nature. And then you look at what's happening in Afghanistan, and you see the, the stark contrast. What are they thinking? Well, we should have many blessings of liberty. That's the way the founding generation put it in the beautifully crafted preamble to the Constitution, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. And that is exactly right. The founding generation wanted liberty. I keep coming back to this fundamental point. Liberty is the baseline, not canceling people out because you disagree with them. And so that is so unconstitutional, or at least anti-constitutional, if people do it as in their individual capacities, that you don't say it's unconstitutional. It's just wrong, right, to say, I don't want to hear your voice, your voice is dangerous, and so forth. That's not who we are, and I talk about that in the book and hopefully provide a tool that will be useful to people in the marketplace of ideas before school boards and the like to please let's honor the great tradition of freedom in our country. Isn't it possible, though, that one can have a balance of, of opinion and thought that, yeah, we've, we've always got challenges, and we've got to constantly work on those challenges to, to form a more perfect union. That was the idea. That's what launched it. But we've also got to take stock of, of what we've achieved and, and recognize that as well. Yes, and I think thoughtful voices are increasingly recognizing that. And I'll just say one thing. I was so thankful during brief point during the Olympics that the athletes from the United States really celebrated our country uh, as opposed to denigrating it. Of course, we need to do better. And one of the voices from the past that calls us to do exactly what you're calling uh, on on everyone to do now is that of Frederick Douglass, who lived in slavery. Yeah. And yet he saw the goodness of America and America's institutions. Yeah, and we've got to at least recognize that. The problem I have is we, we, we seem to be on this trek to tear down lots of those institutions institutions and and eliminate that which made this country uh, so great. And that's why we have to educate ourselves, to inform ourselves about what these institutions are all about, what the principles of liberty are all about. And I do hope that this book will be a tool that's useful for grandparents to share with their grandchildren 
and parents, but also I've written this in such a way that I hope high school students themselves, perhaps before they go off to college, uh, will and the seniors this year and this academic year will read the book and profit from it and learn about America and in the sweet land of liberty. What what would you want readers to take away from the book? Is there there are key points? That we do have a culture of freedom and that the Supreme Court is our friend and frequently rules unanimously in favor of religious liberty, even in very difficult circumstances and, const- and constitutionally challenging circumstances. So to, so agree. Uh, where can we find the book and uh, learn more about your work? Wherever books are sold, including it is available by audio. You can listen to the book. That's awesome. <laughs> Mr. Starr, it's been an honor and a pleasure, sir, having you in today. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. We'll be back with more talk here on the JT.